quick announcement on the Wirewheel side. We're, we're very excited to announce that we've just launched our new universal pre uh, preference and consent platform. It's now generally available. Um, and our new platform is really addressing those critical needs, um, you know, specifically around some of the new laws in the United States and, and globally. And we're really you know, looking forward to, to working with companies, um, you know, helping really solve for some of the new requirements around the country, especially around the, the, uh, the Sephora enforcement decision in California. You know, we've had a, a phenomenal uh, second day of our Spokes Winter Conference, uh, and um, I'm really delighted uh, by the next session we're going to be bringing to each of you. Um, we have here uh, a very important topic, uh, and we have a friend and a colleague to so many of us in, uh, in our community who's been leading the way on uh, the topic of uh, a national privacy law here in the United States. Um, and as I said, for the last couple of days and spokes, we've covered um, a lot of topics relating to all of the state laws that are coming into effect here in the United States over the next few years. Uh, we've covered important topics around international data transfers, uh, including the new EU-US uh, data privacy framework. Um, but the topic of a national privacy law has been on all of our minds, you know, for years. Um, and the need for it, the, the need to be able to protect consumer rights, uh, the need to establish the United States as a leader on these issues, by having a law um, is something that so many have recognized, uh, but we have together with us here today, uh, Cam Carey, uh, now of Brookings. Previously, uh, Cam served as both the general counsel and the acting secretary of commerce um, and has been deeply involved on the issue of a national privacy law for years and um, has used a lot of the time he spent at Brookings to bring communities together, engage on the Hill, engage with civil society, engage with technology providers uh, to try to tackle these issues. So uh, first of all, Cam, thank you so much for joining us here uh, at our, our Spokes conference. And I wanna give you a moment just to you know introduce yourself, if you don't mind, to the community. As I said, I know so many of us know you but also to talk a little bit about um, you know, your role and, and how you've really focused on a national law uh, over these last few years. Sure. Uh, well, thanks, Justin. And, and it's, it's really it's a pleasure to join you today and enjoy this conference. Uh, I've had a chance to catch some of the, the, the sessions and, and you, know, it's a, you really have put on quite a tour de force of uh, pulling together uh, these uh, panelists and speakers and, and moderating, uh, as far as I can tell, all of the sessions. Uh, uh, but, you know, it's, it's a pleasure to be here today. You know, when I joined the Obama administration of the Commerce Department in 2009, uh, I set out to deal with privacy as a key element of the digital economy uh, and, and saw the, the rules of the digital economy broadly as an important part of, of you know, the general counsel's role within uh, the Department of Commerce with its role in trade and technology. Um, and you know, so many of the issues that are important today. So set out to, uh, to do what became the Consumer Privacy Bill of Rights. Uh, uh, which was released but it was a policy statement from from the White House in 2012 um, and have stayed involved in those issues uh, since joining the Brookings Institution not long after I left the Garrick Department in 2013 um, and have remained engaged with all of that. Of course, you mentioned 
you know, the importance of U.S. leadership. And I think that was something that that you know, we saw all of us who were involved in this issue at the Commerce Department as an important element of what we were doing. And for a while there, we were kind of on the same track as the EU and, you know, looking to get something out in 2012. That's when uh, the GDPR was introduced as legislation. You know, it's, it's taken a lot longer in the US, it's, it's taken too long, um, it, but you know, it's unfinished business. It's work that, that I have been involved in uh, deeply at Brookings and uh, particularly for a while, I was in, you know, a privacy lawyer, uh, as well as uh, you know, working at a, at a think tank and, and affiliated with MIT. But you know, when when in 2018 uh, uh, we started to have a serious debate about privacy legislation, following Cambridge Analytica and you know all of those Zuckerberg hearings, uh, uh, I realized I couldn't be as engaged in that debate as I wanted to be and have obligations to uh, a law firm and particularly to law firm clients. So I decided to you know, uh, uh, really focus my energies, my attention, my work on what I've been doing at, at Brookings. Sorry about that. You always have a moment in a panel where I can't get the, the mute off. No, I mean, uh, Cam, yeah. you covered it. You know, it is interesting when you put the timeline together that way, Cam, that when you were engaged during the Obama administration to, you know, 2012, it just, you know, just even thinking historically, it was 2011 that uh, the European uh, directive on cookie uh, management came out, right? So that's right. funny. We kind of think about that as quaint now, but if you think about it in a timeline, you had the cookie directive introduced in 2011. Then you're saying GDPR was introduced 2012. Um, and that's the moment you were working so deeply on, you know, trying to rally the government to mm -hmm. you know, on an interagency process to issue, you know, uh, a version of the Bill of Rights. Then, of course, the Snowden disclosures happen. Yeah. You see acceleration on the GDPR side, and you see the US trailing. Um, I, I'm going to ask you one question before we jump ahead for a moment, just because um, one thing I learned a lot about when I was also working at the Commerce Department, Cam, um, and I, you can talk about it, this at any level you feel comfortable, but there's an entire interagency process that actually occurs before an administration or mm -hmm. a president or a White House releases a Bill of Rights or a piece of draft legislation. And honestly, I, I don't know that I realized what happens and how that process works, but you know, there's an interactive or a discussion that occurs between you know, mm -hmm. agencies like the Commerce Department that might be leading on commercial privacy but it also involves national security, intelligence community, DOJ, uh, civil enforcement agencies who might be able to, you know, might have a perspective that they would want to collect data for enforcement purposes. And there's a give and take about these processes that also obviously informs and as involves outside stakeholders. Uh, would you mind just giving a, a moment about that? Like, what is the what is the interagency process? The interagency. That's one yeah. of those great government uh, terms. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, you know, there are different, every, lots of agencies that have what the government uh, likes to call equities, uh, um, legal authorities, interests. I mean, I explain equities as as you know, it's a function of of you know, how, how broad a, a, a lane do you have in terms of what your legal authority is and you know, what your size is. I mean, if the Department of Defense wants to get involved in an issue, um, uh, no matter how peripheral, um, you know, it's like a big Mac tr truck driving down the highway. And I, I describe you know, being in the federal government uh, as a little bit like, like 
being on a highway in rush hour traffic where everybody's sort of going in the same direction, but with different destinations. And, you know, you may be driving in a little Prius and, um, you know, getting uh, buffeted around by uh, a big Mack truck blowing by. And, um, you know, certainly the Department of Defense can be that big Mack truck. Um, uh, and I, I wouldn't describe the Department of Commerce as, as small as a Prius, but uh, it's a lot more compact. And, and, you know, part of getting along in the federal government is just figure out how to weave your way through all of that traffic to get where, where you're going. That's, that's part of the art of government. And, and you know, these, it, this can be challenging. I mean, I remember when the Snowden stories first came out and that's when it was right in the middle of doing that interagency process to get draft legislation out. And you know, my first reaction, first story was literally, oh shit, there goes the opportunity to put out privacy legislation because we are about to face you know, a controversy about government collection. We can't have a discussion about what's happening on the commercial side. And of course, then the next day are the stories about the WISM uh, program so that a so-called Section 702 collection, as Peter Swire mentioned, that initial story got it wrong in terms of how the government was collecting, said there's direct access to all the servers. Um, and I'm thinking, you know, oh God, there goes all the work that we have been doing with the EU to try to persuade them that Americans really care about privacy and US intelligence doesn't collect every bit of information on the internet all over the world. Yeah. I, I, and, the way, and, you know, that's that. And, and as, as you said, I mean, GDPR was tied up in knots at that point. Um, and it just went forward uh, quickly. And, and similarly, a few months before that, I had been in Brussels uh, uh, at a parliamentary hearing. Vivian Redding, the commissioner that preceded uh, Didier Renders and Vera Yorova, um, uh, told the parliament, safe harbor is here to stay. And about a month after Snowden, she says, well, I think maybe safe harbor is not so safe anymore. And it's still affecting us today. It will affect uh, the debate about the new uh, uh, privacy framework uh, and adequacy. Yeah, I, I agree with you. And so I agree with you. And I think, again, that, that history is such a perfect baseline for what's going on here. And I'm going to bring up one more piece of almost history, but it's still real. When I'm asked from my perspective about how hard it is to pass national legislation involving privacy. And when you if you bring in the perspective you just said, Cam, which is this is a piece of legislation that almost every agency can claim remit, like some responsibility or otherwise. To me, the best illustration of how hard it is to pass privacy legislation is ECPA, the Electronic Communications Privacy Act. And I'll just lay this out there for everybody listening. <clears throat> this is an act. It has many things to it, so I don't want to overly simplify. And it was passed in the 1980s. And obviously, Cam, you've written about this and spoken about this, so I know we're mm -hmm. some to I suspect, on this. But one provision in this act provides that Basically, for email providers, so think Google, it used to be AOL, you know, your email provider, there's a provision in it, and I may get this a little long, wrong because it's been a while, that if you leave email, one, me or you, we leave email on an email provider for more than 180 days, we have waived our privacy right effectively, and 
the government can go directly to the email provider and retrieve that email without a warrant. That's what the law says. And again, I'm paraphrasing. And most of the time, Cam, when I explain that to an audience, everybody's face is a bit shocked because most of us now think of email just like you think of regular mail and the idea sure. that the government can get it without a warrant makes no sense. And whenever an amendment has come up for this in Congress over the last, you know, however many years, it's supported by 99% of everybody polled, and yet they haven't been able to amend it in part because a lot of the civil agencies and a lot of the national security agencies, among others, will say very clearly in the interagency process and out of it, we need to be able to collect this data directly from the email providers without a warrant. So I, to me, that always illustrates just how yeah. hard it is to get this done. Do you have any reaction to the ECRA? Well, I think, that, I, I think that's right. Although I think that uh, ECRA is sort of limping along, um, but you know, really to some extent at the mercy of the Justice Department. I mean, there was a decision, I think it was out of the Fifth Circuit, it's now about a dozen years ago, the Warshak decision that says, well, no, you do need a warrant for content uh, you know, under the Fourth Amendment. Um, uh, and, and the Justice Department has kind of acceded to that as the law nationally, rather than saying, okay, that's what we'll do, you know, Sixth Circuit, and we'll do differently everywhere else. I think recognizing uh, that that you know, the uh, if this thing went to the Supreme Court, uh, and this has been borne out by subsequently the Carpenter case, the Jones cases, uh, applying the Fourth Amendment in new technology contexts, um, that yeah, you do need uh, a warrant for that. So, um, uh, but you're right; that's not what the law says. And, you know, I testified on ECPA reform uh, more than once and spent a fair amount of time negotiating with the, the FBI and uh, you know, other agencies about it. But, you know, that's, that's hard because you know, law enforcement's natural inclination to say, well, we might want to use that sometime. And so we want to preserve the option, if we have it, to get a hold of, of, of that information. Um, that's the status quo when it comes to ECMA. Right. And by the way, I, I agree with you. I, I don't want to overstate and make people think that DOJ is just going in willy nilly. But my point here was that even on something that most human beings would say doesn't really seem the right thing. And even if you talk about an absolutely surgical proposal to fix something like that, even that is well, hard to get done. So I guess that's the framework in which yeah. we bring up the new law, you know, Ken? Well, all that said, it is remarkable that we have gotten as far as we have towards, uh, towards national privacy legislation with the bipartisan agreement on the American uh, data privacy uh, protection. Act um, uh, and you know in a bill that I think is much stronger than uh, anything that I envisioned even you know three or four years ago, um, much less what was politically possible in uh, you know back in the Obama administration. You, know, you took over on the uh, the legislative portfolio after I left and were around when the Department of Commerce put out a bill in 2015 um, and you know, ran into an industry buzzsaw, you know, from what I gather, uh, you know, uh, uh, Cheryl Sandberg uh, uh, on the phone with the Secretary of Commerce uh, on you know, how, how you can't do this. Um, that was the politics then. Now you have Facebook saying we need regulation. I think you know a lot of things: uh, Snowden, GDPR, uh, the recognition of uh, the need for uh, for U.S. legislation, um, and frankly, you know, for a basis for trust 
I think has changed the debate dramatically. And of course, tech lash um, has kind of united Republicans and Democrats uh, uh, as well. But um, well, that brings it to us. So the American Data Privacy and Protection Act, we're, we're at the point where we have it passed in one house. Well, let, let me just step back. I'll, let me turn it over to you. Tell us where are we? Tell us, you know, where where do things stand as we're in this lame duck? Well, and I know you've been doing so much work on this. You know, well, we are, uh, as I said, closer than we have ever been. Um, uh, you know, the bill has been reported out uh, from the House Energy and Commerce Committee. I voted fifty three to two. Uh, uh, and, you know, that's a pretty extraordinary level of bipartisan support. Um, you know, we're now in a lame duck session. Um, it's hard for bills to, uh, you know, to, to claim time and attention um, in that kind of limited window. But, you know, I do see uh, at least some glimmer of hope yet that the uh, that this can happen and that that can come to the House floor. And if you get the kind of vote on the House floor that the committee vote indicates, it would go to the Senate with a strong endorsement and a chance uh, that uh, the Senate uh, would then take that. Up. And I think, you know, I think it would be hard for the Senate to resist that kind of vote and for Democrats in the Senate to uh, um, Chuck Schumer, uh, uh, Senator Cantwell, others to say no to a bill that's got strong privacy protections, civil rights protections, you know, a, a private right of action, um, and that you know, has um, you know, as well out, uh, uh, some, some algorithmic transparency and accountability provisions. Um, uh, so I think things that really go beyond where we are today, beyond uh, what California and the states have done. Uh, and, you know, I spent about a, a week ago, I was playing around a little bit with, with chat GPT. Um, and I, I gave it the prompt to write, write an op-ed for the New York Times on a uh, comprehensive pri privacy bill. Um, uh, called the American Data Privacy and Pr Protection Act. And I you know, framed it that way in part because ChatGPT says, well, our, our learning, uh, you know, learning data um, only goes through 2021, so it's not familiar with current events. Um, so that's why I say a bill, a bill called. Um, and interestingly, you know, the, the results that I kept getting saying, well, this um, uh, you know, provides for increased transparency for, for individuals. So companies have to disclose what they're collecting. Um, it gives individuals rights of control, of access, et cetera. I very much focused on that. Um, and very little about the sort of fundamental aspects of privacy protection, which is you know, the collection, the use, and the sharing of data. Um, but that is, in fact, the significant leap that, that the ADPPA makes in, in you know, focusing collection on what's necessary and proportionate for the product or the service or for other specifically defined purposes. So we get away from you know, all the cookie consents and pop-ups and uh, that have been so much a part of both GDPR uh, and uh, uh, the, the state laws. And instead into a framework where the burden is on the companies that collect and use the data uh, to, to uh, meet consumer expectations. And consumers can rely on the law rather than you know, their own reading of consents or access to data or you know, other rights which are important, but you know, not sufficient to protect privacy. Yeah, so this is, you've hit on a ton of important topics. And I, again, I know we're gonna run out of time. 
I also love these little debates. Cam, so I'll throw out a couple of a couple of little debatey type uh, questions for you as we go. And I will say, I see so many friends of both of ours in the audience that if you all have questions or items that you'd like Cam uh, to talk about today, please put them in the Q and A, uh, and we'll come to them here in a moment. Um, I'll, I'll be a little provocative as I ask this question, but. You have to admit, California, you know, for thinking about the consumer side of it, they did get it done. They got it done in version one. Yeah. They got it done in version two. And you have to admit, there's something kind of amazing about somebody like uh, Alistair just, you know, I'm going to fund it. I'm going to put it on the ballot. I'm going to back it. And he gets it passed. And it's impressive. Mm -hmm. and not only that, but you have the California Attorney General, Cam. I believe, I don't know if you came to one of our sessions. But within, you know, they issued a pretty significant fine against a consumer brand sure. and they basically said, you're not, you know, you're not getting the rights we said enforced. And now, you know, we're a technology provider, as you know, and you're watching, you know, brands suddenly wake up and realize, well, we really need to get done what was in CCPA. And you can kind of see the attorney general in California working we're getting ready for the new CPRA, ready to enforce this thing. And so mm -hmm. we do have a really interesting laboratory of innovation going on in California. And in our last spokes, I don't know if you managed to, uh, to make it, but we had a terrific session with Phil Weiser out of Colorado. And Phil came in loaded for bear, not only on the policy needs, but he's deep technically on how things flow and you know they're issuing regulations quickly. So there's obviously something very powerful and very agile and sort of interesting about the innovation you can get legally at the state level one by one. And one of the major tension points that I know has come up a lot is the tension between state laws and the federal law and preemption and non-preemption and what will stand and when. Um, and I know you've written about sort of whether the existence of the state laws is going to impede the progress towards a federal law or, or how. Um, so anyway, maybe I could just ask you, how do you see the relationship between this, uh, you know, the, a, the, the new potential law and these state laws? Yeah. Well, you that's to be a blocker. And, um, you know, is there is there anything that you think would get this across the line in a way that wouldn't preempt the best parts of the of the state laws. Yeah, I um, look. That is the stumbling block right now. I mean, I said that there's a glimmer of hope for this bill in in the lame duck session, um, but I think that that glimmer is honestly fading. You know, because um, you know, because really the of the California issue and um, that that you know, people you've mentioned. Uh, um, and uh, Governor Newsom and uh, and Speaker Pelosi uh, are insisting that that you know, that, that California be uh, what they're calling a floor. Um, and you know, I think there's a lot of demand for uh, for broader preemption, um, certainly among Republicans, among some Democrats. Uh, um, in on the industry side, and I, some of that for good reasons. Um, um, you know, you're in the compliance business. I think you understand the amount of back end engineering that goes into uh, dealing with the different consents, tracking uh, things like a global privacy control, and and you know, ensuring that you you collect, and manage the data you need to do that, um, but you know, not what you're you're, you're not, not allowed to collect. And you know, that's all exceedingly complicated. I mean, I remember uh, the challenges of the data mapping um, uh, and you know, for the charting the consents and uh, all of the UX work and in engineering work that goes into to that. So um, that is a compliance challenge. Uh, I did listen to the discussion about you know, dealing with uh, advertising uh, rules under the um, you know the, the state laws. Um, there's a reason 
that that Europe went from a directive to a regulation so that they could be consistent across all of their member states. Um, and I think that has value to consumers as well as to businesses. So you know, they have a consistent set of expectations in that where they live, what sectors they're, they're dealing with uh, as much as possible. Um, so I think, you know, the, the standard that's in the anti-PVA um, actually gives a fair amount of latitude. I mean, certainly there are carve-outs for a lot of the state privacy laws, privacy torts, um, a number of other things. I mean, I think um, most other people I know who study preemption think, for example, that the, the age-appropriate design code would not be preempted. Um, I think, in fact, that the latitude that, that exists under the covered by standard where you know, it's got to be substantially subsumed by state law has got to be substantially subsumed by federal law. That gives a fair amount of latitude there. So, um, you know, could there be some additional carve outs, say for automated processing for California? Yeah, I think those are some things that could be explored, but I think, um, you know, a, a broad, a complete floor approach, um, you know, I think, uh, will kill the bill. So you're you're kind of seeing that if the law were to carve out the if if the state laws were to be viewed as a floor effectively, if that were part of the law, it probably wouldn't pass. Correct. And there's I, I don't know where things stand, Cam. So again, I'll leave it to you. But is is it is it is there a path to passage through the California delegation if California law is preempted? I mean, do you see that as a as a possible? Well, I think that that could be possible if if with two things, if they can be persuaded first that, that there's more latitude in the provisions that are there, then then I think they recognize I mean, I think some of the rhetoric that I'm seeing from California officials or from the board, I think is, is you know, overstating the impact of the federal law on California. Um, uh, and you know, the, the notion that they can't audit to, uh, um, you know, or do carry out some of their enforcement activities for the federal law, I think is, is misplaced. Um, but I also think you know, that, that there's kind of a jigsaw that, that the law has taken to state laws. UDAPs uh, uh, would remain in place. Uh, other laws of general applicability. Um, uh, and, but you know, also including privacy torts, um, facial recognition uh, laws, some things like that. I, you could add some more things along those lines to take care of particular interests that California has, like what I mentioned, automated decision-making and profiling. So maybe they get some latitude to do something there and Got some other areas that are, are key concerns. So that that to you is the path at this point, Cam? Is that, um, is that that's kind of the path that's, I could tell you is being being explored, yeah. What um, if if you were to highlight, if you don't mind, and, and again, listen, I know I know just like you and me, we can sort of go down deep into things, but at the highest level, let's assume something does happen here. You know, Cam, uh, a lot of our community is, you know, they're 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 folks trying to help companies get this right. So mm -hmm. uh, let's assume that folks have been preparing for all the state laws, and now you have the federal law coming in. What were the what are the handful of things that you get excited about, both from the you know the data subject, the human being, the person side that is really captured in this in this version of the bill? Mm -hmm. Well, I think uh, to me the the biggest thing is what I why did I mention the uh, the boundaries on uh, collection, use, and sharing of of information. Um, and I think that that 
you know, provides, I think, both some, some clear direction uh, and you know, a streamlined approach to, to the, the user interfaces and consents. It certainly reduces uh, the role of consent. Um, you know, that's still going to be necessary, at least to share sensitive information. Um, uh, and you know, I think, uh, uh, look, I think the other big thing here is the civil rights dimension. I mean, that is something that is new. Um, uh, you know, this is a civil rights bill for the 21st century that would apply uh, in the online context that would be potentially subject to, to the, uh, the private right of action. So people are going to have to focus a lot more on you know, are there ways. Do you mind giving a little bit more? Used? On that? I, I don't um, mean to interrupt. But do you mind giving a little bit more on that? Because I have that's a that's an important provision, and I'm not sure it's gotten the attention. Can yeah. That, yeah, yeah. I mean, there is a provision that says you, know, you can't, in effect, you cannot use personal information in ways that would discriminate uh, against protected categories under civil rights laws, uh, um, race, sex, um, uh, sexual preference, uh, disability, and, and others. Um, uh, and you know, would give that gives federal agencies, uh, anti-discrimination agencies sort of added authorities there, but also becomes enforceable um, you know, through through the private right of action, um, and comes along with some uh, uh, impact assessment and algorithmic uh, assessments. And in the case of larger providers, a very specific algorithmic uh, impact assessment. So it's going to mean measuring, uh, you know, where the the effect of algorithms. Uh, that you know have consequential effects on the individuals. Uh, uh, so looking at those in advance, uh, looking at the design of the algorithm, the data, um, uh, the application, and the reliability, um, and then measuring after the fact. Uh, those are listen. Those are really key. You know, the other one that we've seen gather a lot of attention is the, the sort of concept of uh, executive certifications, Cam. In other yep. words, you know, something like a Sarbanes-Oxley style certification. Can you talk a little bit about that? Sure. Um, you know, that is also something that is in there and something new for, for so-called large data holders. And I not recall offhand uh, the, the threshold for that. It's, it's relatively large, but I'm sure that you have uh, people in this audience whose companies would fit fit that description. Um, yeah, it is very similar to Sarbanes Oxley. It requires uh, um, you know executive uh, certification uh, um, you know, of of compliance um, with the obligations of of, of the act. That's a big. That's a big one. I mean, it'll make a huge difference, right, all the way down. So, uh, sure. Yeah. I mean, we've certainly seen. I mean, saw this uh, very much in dealing with cybersecurity with uh, law firm clients. That uh, when the SEC started requiring disclosures on that subject, uh, that got C-suite attention, got board attention, um, and I think that would be the same. The same effect here. You know, it's got a big reputational impact for companies now, um, but once it starts you know, getting executives themselves, uh, that's a whole different thing. Well, listen, I mean, Cam, I knew we would run out of time, so but I do want to give us a moment or so. You're in the last few weeks of the lame duck, and you've got a whole community I know who wants to support. So if you can't tell us, tell us what folks can do and where you think this is going. Um, and obviously, you know, this is your chance to give us a prediction if you want to put one on the. On the uh, you know, I've, uh, I've I've been too wrong, Justin, too many times. Uh, I think to venture that, and I, you know, I don't want to preempt your your next panel. So, 
I'll I'll let them pick this up. But I, they're they're you know likely to predict this is going to the next Congress. Um, uh, I'm not sure that we pick up uh, where we we leave off. So I think there is the opportunity now uh, to get this done. I think a lot of the crux comes uh, with with members from California. Um, uh, and you know, I uh, I would like to persuade uh, persuade people in California that the, for the reasons I think that I've talked about that the federal law is better, stronger, more protective law, better for both business and consumers, um, uh, and certainly better for America to have a national law uh, as we go out dealing with with our allies across a host of issues where you know, information technology has become central to, to international organizations and the international uh, debate. Um, but uh, you know, short of uh, persuading people in California of that, um, that we can figure out a path forward that will meet those interests and you know not to simply draw a hard line. I saw heard uh, a poll today about the extraordinary number of people who who uh, want Congress, this Congress, the next Congress to operate in a bipartisan way. There is an opportunity to do that now and uh, you know do it in and on an issue which may not be the same dimensions as the Affordable Care Act but which is a big deal for really everyone in America. Everybody's data is at issue. Uh, Cam, that's a phenomenal close. And if there's anything folks can do, please let us know. I'm sure you'd have support from so many of the community. And thank you for all you're doing at Brookings. Hey, cool. To rally and share knowledge and bring folks together around, around this important issue. I I, uh, I think it's fun. And if we can help in any way, let us know. Thanks, Justin. Thanks for the invitation to be here. I appreciate it. And uh, on behalf of all of us, you know, Cam, thank you. We'll invite you back, I hope, to update us, hopefully on success here uh, when we come into the spring. Um, and for those, um, you know, online, we have one last session coming up next. It's our, our traditional closing of each spokes. We invite a couple of our friends and colleagues and experts to give a very fast, it's it's not an hour long, it's usually 15 to 20, 15, 25 minutes, privacy protections for 2023. Uh, we'll be on at the top of the hour with uh, Laura Leitner from Goodwin and Pedro Pavan, who so many of us know uh, from other circumstances. So again, Cam, thank you for joining us for this session. It was fantastic. And hopefully we'll see everybody else in the next session. At